Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to a discussion on talent, and that's one of the largest discussions that I've had everywhere that I've gone today and in the past. Uh, we just had a meeting this morning with Via Christi, and, and they're experiencing talent problems. Uh, we've heard from Textron, uh, from Spirit, uh, from Bombardier, uh, but we appreciate the work that uh, not only the uh, uh, GWP is put on uh, together, but uh, we have Dr. Sherry Utash in the audience that helps us uh, greatly with that. Uh, one of the things that was discussed this morning, and I just want to bring it up so that everybody can start thinking about it, we just celebrated the passing of uh, the aviation tax credit mm -hmm. uh, here just uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, well, this morning when we were meeting with uh, with uh, Via Christi, they're having the same kind of problems as we're having uh, on the health side. And they said what they really need is a health tax credit. Mm. So uh, I just want to put that bug in everybody's ear as we look forward to our uh, legislative agenda for the next uh, uh, fiscal year. Uh, please think about the uh, possibility of having a, a health uh, tax credit. I know that uh, GWP has a number of segments that we look at, oil and gas, aviation, but health is one of those areas. So. Uh, keep that in mind, if you yes, would. Sir. I appreciate it. Yes, and I appreciate everyone being here today. Uh, Commissioner Meitzner is not going to be available. We are taping this. Uh, you'll be able to see it on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, also, uh, Commissioner Howell has to leave about 125. Uh, but this is an important discussion. Sedgwick County uh, invested in the, the outcomes of, of this study. And today is the first time that we as commissioners and the public uh, are going to be able to see the results of it. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. And you can introduce the other folks in the room, please. Uh, we will do that, sir. And, and we appreciate the opportunity to, to come and present this to the commissioners. And But present's not necessarily the right word because we were partners in so many different ways. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Mike, Sort of reached out to me this morning and, and told me that he regretted he couldn't be here and so I gave him a quick update on where we are so because I know that he is extremely interested in what's happening uh, in this conversation today but certainly as we go forward so uh, but again thank you for the opportunity to be with you all you know one of the things that um, interesting enough I mean we've we've been partnering with the county in a lot of different ways if you think about over the last 30 months there's been a lot of ways um, you know we started around talent with the 737 uh, max production suspension, you know, right in 2020. Uh, there was a lot of conversations about talent in that in that time frame, and then COVID hit, uh, and so then working with you to, and I know Megan Carver's in the audience today, where we worked on get trained, get paid. Like, how is it that we connect people who have been forced into unemployment because of what was going on in the economy, that there are still jobs here in this community, or there's training available uh, for you to be able to get back into the workforce. So working with you in that capacity, I think the thing that we love too is that you've allowed us to have a nimbleness. I mean, you all invest in the partnership on an annual basis. Uh, the public investment is what we push toward the initiatives. And so you allow us a nimbleness to be able to hit what needs to be hit. Um, during COVID is when this conversation really started to emerge. Uh, Dr. Utash is here with us today. And, you know, Sherry called, it was about April, May. Uh, so we were just getting into it. And she was already thinking, when we get out of it, uh, what is it we need to be thinking of? And the thing that, that you all allowed us to do, because we didn't have this information in front of us at that time. We were trying to figure out what are the questions to ask, uh, what is it we need to be leaning into, and you, you provide us the flexibility to be able to do that. And so uh, we're, we're glad to be able to come to you today to say, here are definitive things. Uh, but importantly, it's how it's already being mobilized. We're, we're not saying we're going to start tomorrow. We've already really pushing forward with this. Um, we do have a number of people that I, I just want to know quickly. Uh, from our team, uh, Evan Roselle, where are you? Evan is right here to my right. Uh, you know Evan. Uh, Evan works closely with you as well. Megan Carver, who has been, again, I already noted Megan, but she's been working with us on talent in a lot of different capacities. Uh, and then Tammy Bradley. Tammy, there you go. Uh, Tammy 
you know, we, we hired Tammy to be the project manager on this, uh, this work plan, if you will. Um, and then as we really began to look at how we were going to move it forward, uh, Tammy, we, we started to have a conversation, and Tammy goes, I want to stay on. I want to be a part of how it is that we mobilize this, which that's a huge benefit to us and I think to you as well as an investor because Tammy understands this. Uh, she's already started to mobilize it, and so she literally, this has become part of majority of her work plan now as she goes forward for the next couple of years working with the partnership and how we engage the community. So uh, those are folks from our team that are here with us today. Um, a number of folks that you're going to hear from, too, uh, today uh, that were part of the coalition, some of the, the work that we did. Um, uh, Deborah Gladney with Quick Hire. I think I saw Deborah walk in. There you go. Um, I'm a little disoriented up here. <laughs> there are people to my back. But Deborah, you know, we you're going to hear from Deborah today. I think a great perspective about uh, risk taking in our community and, and how you step into that, uh, what that requires, not only from her point of view, but also from the community's point of view. What is it we need to be doing to step in as a community as we go forward? Joseph Shepard, right here to my right, you know, Joseph was a big part. He's, he's chief of staff for Lead for America, and so Joseph was also a part of the voice coming into the conversation around what do we need to be mindful of? Um, I know he's going to talk a little bit more about DEI and some of the things to be mindful of as we move forward with the workforce plan. Stephanie Harder, uh, also at the end of the table. Stephanie, you know, working with Textron, just an incredible employer in our community that you know. Um, they're doing incredible things, and she'll tell you a little bit about that because as they continue to look at how is it they grow in our community, what are those needs with workforce? How is it we're mindful of that uh, on the front end of it, right, as they move forward? Uh, and then I've already mentioned Dr. Utash. She'll speak to it. And then Keith. Keith Lyon working with Workforce Alliance. Um, Keith will also speak into some of the things. You know, when we started this, this was one of the projects that Keith said, I'm in. Uh, and so we appreciate that partnership. But he'll speak more into some of the uh, One Workforce grant that they're working through and how this fits into that. So all this is coming together. Uh, I think it demonstrates the collaborativeness of our community. Um, and it also demonstrates that together we're going to accelerate where we need to with workforce development. Um, Part of today, as the chairman, you know, I remember that commission meeting, the chairman said, I, I wanna, one of the things I want you all to obligate yourself to is that you'll come back and you'll give us an update on where you are with things. Commissioner, this will be one of several updates. We don't feel like this is a one-time moment. We feel like as we continue to progress, we're going to want to come back to you to say, here's the things that we're seeing. Here are the things that we're moving forward. Here are the things we're having some challenges with. Uh, how is it that we need it together to, to mitigate those so that we do see progress? So our commitment to you is that we're going to continue to, to have these type of conversations as we go forward. Uh, but again, we also want you to hear from individuals involved with it. You know, part of this slide talks about a community that defies expectations. That is our vision. That is our goal, is that we're going to have that reputation across North America, but even beyond, uh, that we are a community that defies expectations. Um, you'll see also on the slide, formerly, the, work, the future of work and workforce strategy. As we got into this, more and more working with industry, but also in individual conversations, it really is about a talent roadmap. Talent is a very broad, encompassing term. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects of talent development, and you'll hear some of that today. So we really are looking at this as being a talent roadmap uh, to be able to communicate that even more clearly and concisely to the community as well. One of the things that you know about us with the partnership is that we work deliberately to connect things. We don't do one analysis over here and it sits in this column. We do another one and it sits over here. If you think back to Project Wichita pre-COVID, um, there was a lot of things that were, I think, reiterated in this work to say these are things to still be very mindful of. Some of those things consist of create opportunities to retain college graduates. We know that's a piece of what we must, must be doing. Increase educational opportunities to meet the changing requirements of the workforce itself. So in the workplace. So again, something that we heard during Project Wichita that through this work we're going to be able to see progress and movement forward. And it also I think solidifies to the region, we still hear you on these things being important. The other part is support career pathways. You know, if anything, we've seen an acceleration of digitization, automation from the moment of COVID, right? It's really moved a lot of things. We do things differently in our daily lives that have been a catalyst coming out of COVID. So again, how is it we support those career pathways in a very changing environment? Support after high school education. You know, Sherry will talk about it and Keith. We have a number of high school graduates 
but where do they go? Some of them we don't know, and we need to be able to answer that question. So again, after high school, how is it that we step into that? Um, and then develop strong talent retention. So how is it we continue to create a city, a community, a region, a state, that talent, they don't want to leave. They want to remain here in our state or in our region uh, to call this home as they go forward in their life. Um, the talent roadmap gives us those opportunities. As I mentioned briefly, we know there's needs today. You know, uh, the chairman and I were down, you know, at Textron uh, just this last Friday, and, and, you know, they were walking through some of the things that they're really getting into is new diversification within aerospace. One of the things I heard from, from Stephanie and Maggie topping both is talent. We need talent. So there are things that we're doing today to step into that. Um, one in particular is that we, we're watching across the country if there's, if there's an industry that's maybe – uh, diminishing its its presence in the community, those workforce could be people who could come here. So we're we're working through that uh, in a in I think a respectful way to say we have jobs, just like the get trained get paid. We have jobs. If you want to remain in this industry, we have opportunities. So really working in that capacity, um, the aviation tax credit, huge. How does that become a model for other things that you, you just mentioned with healthcare, Mr. Chairman? I think we we pay attention to that. The CNA legislation. I know Sherry will talk about that. Huge thing in the, in the media the last few weeks. And I also know that you all are looking at how is it that you invest, just like today, in workforce development. So again, your, your engagement there is important. Internship programs. Uh, and then also, we cannot, uh, I know a number of you, I think every one of you were a part either of the Deloitte Summit or the, the large event that they, the kickoff event they had out at Doc Hanger. Deloitte really brought this together for us, and that's who we engaged them for a purposeful reason, and that is the work they've done in talent. But I think you've seen demonstrated through the Smart Factory and then also just in what you heard in that summit, this is the time to be really focused on this. The other piece of this is that this guidebook that we have, uh, we have a time now where we're rolling it out, but this will get out across the country. We have a moment right now to be really purposeful and accelerate what we're doing. Uh, we want to be on the front end of these implementations of these strategies and initiatives. Louise just walked in. Louise is another, uh, Rodriguez, who is another person you'll hear from today that's a part of that coalition. So, Louise, thanks for being here, sir. You're all over the media, so thanks for being here. Um, but again, all these things are coming to fruition. Um, the next slide, let's see, what's the best way here? There we go. We just want to remind you, these were, these were all the funders, okay? So, along with yourself, uh, the partnership put in uh, investment, Commerce Depar Department put in investment. An important thing with that is that to remember the framework of growth. That's driving the state as far as their economic strategies. Lieutenant Governor Tolan saw a direct connection to this work to drive across the state. So again, Commerce invested in this project as well. Workforce Alliance, we went and sat down with Keith and literally in two minutes, Keith is like, I'm in. Uh, and so Keith, again, thank you for that the city and yourself coming together to all make this possible. This was not a budgeted project. And I think the thing to communicate to the community is that we recognize there was a moment we really needed to step into and there was a nimbleness both on the public side and the private side to say, let's get answers to this. And so again, we appreciate you all stepping into that with us. So these are all the investors. These are all the, the various groups that we are purposely making sure that we stay engaged with as we continue to move forward. One of the things I wanted to do, uh, and I'll do this briefly, is just to kind of revisit. These are the things, and I won't necessarily read through all this, but these are the things that we asked about deliverables. What are the things that we're going to look for coming out of this work? So Deloitte had a number of deliverables, deliverables here. You'll see where it was to be a collaborative regional strategy. We wanted regional initiatives. Uh, we wanted a timeline. Okay, I think it's really important that we know, hey, we've got to have some measures. We also need to know how that timing is going to work so we can keep ourselves accountable. So timeline for regional initiatives. Data. I'm a big believer in research. Know that you know. Uh, because in that way, you can have conversations that if you can lay it out and say, this is how we got here, I've seen the private sector, I've seen the public sector say, let's go. I mean, it makes sense. I see where we need to go. So again, basing it on data, interviews, I think is critical. We need to continue to have that in part. And what's what Tammy's going to be doing is that the conversations with industry, um, with Dr. Thompson and others, is not, they're not stopping. They're going to be ongoing. How are the, how's the environment changing? How is it that we need to be mindful of that? And what, what evolutions do we need to be mindful of as we work on this work as well? And then also gap and ass, uh, uh, assessment report, like where are the gaps and how do we mitigate those? The other thing I was just going to touch quickly on, 
community strategy outcomes. So what is it that we wanted to see in that category? Certainly aligned and clear focus. Um, that has to be, you know, we need to be able to speak in this in a way where if you're not engaged in it every day, you can quickly understand where we're going and why. Um, we want to really differentiate Wichita in this region. When we were before you originally, we talked about Austin and Nashville and, and these cities that had moments of differentiating themselves. They saw the opportunity, but they enacted on it. They, they got engaged with it. We feel that with talent, it's a, it's across the board conversation, across the board conversations in industry, regardless of what it may be. As we move forward with steps, we believe that this could actually be a differentiator for our community in the conversation. You know, one of the things that with Deloitte, with the Smart Factory, is that they've talked about they're going to have over 5,000 individuals coming through that facility on an annual basis just with Deloitte. How we interpret that is, is that companies are coming in to understand where smart manufacturing, where is it going? I can feel it that I need to be thoughtful about digitalization, automation. How does it apply to my, my company or my industry? But we also understand that part of that conversation is going to be really quick. Well, where's the workforce to enable what you're talking to me about? We want to answer that question proactively, that this community is working on that. Not only is it working, but it's producing. So again, that's a big part of it. Build back better grants. You know, there's a lot of capital coming in to potentially to the community. This type of framework is what organizations like, or agencies like EDA is looking for. They want to know that the community has a roadmap. We had the assistant secretary here from EDA a few weeks ago. Um, and so part of that was, I think, to see what's the coalition like on the local level? Is it one that truly works? And I think it was demonstrated to her, yes, it is. This is a coalition that didn't start yesterday. It's been in place for years. And you can tell that by the way the group was really interchanging with each other. Uh, so all that's really important. And then Keith will talk about the one workforce grant. Again, a mobilization. Actually, Grant had for, uh, Keith had foresight of this because the grant he wrote literally called out some of these things that now this will be a work plan to help hit what uh, Keith needs to achieve in that grant itself. The last slide I'll show you is the implementation outcomes. So these are all things that we want to be successful in leveraging. You know, one of the things that you've heard us talk about is, as we look at, at investment coming into the partnership, is how do we leverage that? With capital investment, if you kind of look at what's been going on in the partnership from end of 15, well, 15 to the end of 2021, we've been able to leverage on capital investment 177 to one. So $177 to return for $1, which is great, right, in capital investment. Annual payroll, we've seen 40 to one. So how do we continue to increase that? And I think, so leveraging is important. Um, how is it that we provide information for educational institutions to leverage together? How is it they work? And I know Sherry will share, how is that collaboration going on with our institutions and how is it we advance things? Really important. There's also the, the opportunity where we see in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, where the job creation is there. The thing is, they want to invest, companies want to invest, but they need the people. So how do we help solve that equation so that companies like Textron and others can do the investment they want to do, but they also understand they've got to have the people to be able to be able to have that investment really true out. The other is, is that um, we know we have a number of, of graduates each year. How do we tap into them? How do we get them into the, the workforce here? And then also, how is it that we make sure we have the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion for our community? How is it that we are creating the opportunities or opening them up, right? How is it that we make sure that we're deliberate in that? Because you have to be. And so all that is wrapped up into what you're going to hear about today. Um, as I turn it over to Tammy to take it forward, uh, again, we just appreciate your all's continued partnership. We have ongoing conversations with each of you uh, and then also working you as a collective. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to really position our community, and we appreciate you being a part of that, not only today, but as we go forward. So, Tammy? All right. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, Tammy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure to be here and to, to present this. Um, those of you who know a little about me know I like planning and I like a good plan. So I think the roadmap, uh, the talent roadmap we have for our community now is one way to do that. And it's a very effective way to do it. I'm going to walk through some highlights from the roadmap, but I really want you all to hear from these folks. They all have their fingerprints on this. They all were very involved in how it developed. They're on the front lines. They see this every day, so I'm going to run through the slides. I'm here. 
any time. In fact, I will likely be reaching out to you after this, but we have a 200-page document of the roadmap. We have about a 100-page data rumble is what Deloitte calls it, uh, and, and we can share that with you. We just didn't want to overwhelm you with that in this, in this type of meeting. So just kind of walk through very quickly. Um, we, knew, we knew there were disruptors in our world before COVID-19. COVID-19 is the latest and the biggest that has disrupted everything for us. The, um, but the other things that really have um, affected us are the technologies, the new talent uh, that re requirements that we have, the diversity and generational changes. All of this is sur swirling around us that is, and we want to be at the forefront of how we make sense of this as a community. So the journey to the future of work uh, was a great process. This makes it look longer than it actually was. It was 12 weeks of intense work from interviews with our community leaders, uh, from healthcare to aviation, nonprofits, philanthropy. Um, we, we really, uh, Deloitte really did a good job of, of reaching out. Uh, they also brought all, uh, as I said, all of their global data with them. So they were able to take that our local input from the interviews, from online focus groups, from uh, the Ambition Lab uh, participants, of which you see a few here. And then, um, and we had everybody participating from frontline aviation workers on the uh, online focus groups to uh, professional, young professionals that participated through the chamber. So, like I said, we really did try to get a range of folks. We had uh, union leaders who were um, interviewed. Um, anyway, so all of that data gathering, all of that process, we brought the group uh, of um, folks together to talk about an ambition statement and then how we get there, okay? Now we're in that activate stage, and that's why I get pretty excited about this stuff. Um, here are some of the, these are the people who participated in the Ambition Labs. It was hours of time together online. Uh, we forget this was all done virtually last year um, and early this year. Um, but this is truly an ex just an uh, extremely bright group of folks. If you ever need anything done, this is the list you need to go to because these people really make it happen. Um, they came up with this ambition statement, and I like the idea that it's called an ambition statement and not a vision statement, because a vision is always just slightly out of our reach. This is what our community will look like when we get this right. You're gonna see a lot of what Deloitte calls commitments. I call them strategies and action plans. Um, all working together, this is what it's going to take. We are a vibrant, global community of possibility that invests boldly, takes risks, and defies expectations, as Jeff said. If you start breaking that down, you understand that we're already a global community. Look around, see who we are as a community. Um, we don't always acknowledge that, but we truly are and we need to be uh, for the type of work that gets done here. We need to be uh, in a community that invests boldly in, in diverse areas in uh, bringing people to uh, solutions or opportunities. Um, we are uh, a, a community that needs to take risks, empower ourselves, and we aren't always really good at that, taking risks. We kind of like to make sure we're, we're following things step by step. Um, and then we really want to defy expectations as we do all of this. I'll say that the, um, the uh, formula that comes out as a result of this, if you take all of those first four components together, that's what will get us to that ambition statement, a community that defies expectation. I'm going to walk through these very quickly um, because I know that um, and this is a little different format for those of you who are here today, um, because I do want to turn this over to you to have a conversation with the commissioners. Um, so under each of these strategies, I will call them, we have action steps, cultivating a vibrant global community. We're going to get a coalition together. We'll probably work with Keith and the coalition he's put together for the One Workforce Grant. These are community leaders who are going to say, are we doing what we said we would do? And are we doing it in a time frame that makes sense? 
we're going to have um, we, we're going to need to activate gathering spots uh, around the region that draws and engages diverse and uh, multicultural audiences. Um, we need to expand air and rail connectivity to Wichita. Uh, uh, Chairman Meitzner has been a, a leader in the connectivity to rail, and we uh, need to continue and support and accelerate that kind of work. And we also need to be looking at how we market ourselves. Um, the partnership and Megan, they've done a great job with Choose Wichita to attract and keep local talent here. Um, but we need to be just always looking at what we can do and do more of that. Under the creating possibilities, we have a, um, a need to have a tight feedback loop between business and industry, I mean, industry and education, so that what industry needs, education can quickly respond to and be agile. And we've done a great job of that here in our community. We're so incredibly fortunate to have the institutes of higher learning that we do here who are willing to work with industry. Um, we need to have a... Um, professional development and training opportunities for our, our, uh, the people who are interested in becoming part of our workforce and, and who are a part of our workforce. And then we need to look at how we um, are, are serving the underserved. How, how, are we, how are we ensuring those 1,300 or 1,500 high school students who seem to kind of just drop out? Um, how do we engage them and find them uh, pathways to go to work and to be successful? Investing boldly, uh, this is all about um, making sure that we're doing what we need to do in terms of uh, preparing people for the jobs of the future. I'm going to go through those just a little bit, but those jobs of the future are here now, and they're going to be changing rapidly as we move forward. But thankfully, we have Deloitte, we have other partners who are thinking about this constantly, people at the table here. And then we're going to do, uh, we need to look at um, long-term investments in things like transit to get people from point A to point B. Um, and, and we need to look at um, making sure that um, those meet the needs of our employers. And I think one of the examples that Deloitte gives here is fascinating because it also encompasses another common thread uh, that's needed in our, that we need to address in our community. And that is the example they throw out here is the employer-sponsored shuttles that go to and from workplaces and child care centers. I mean, if we can figure that out, oh my gosh, people will, I, I believe, people will be knocking down our doors trying to come to Wichita because I don't think any other community has really been addressing that in, in a proactive way. Um, and then um, we need to have those iconic places like uh, some of the communities we often compete with have in terms of like a riverfront that is ideal for young people and people of all ages to go and be a part of. Uh, that increasing our appetite for risk, um, we um, need to establish uh, a, a fund or uh, uh, some sort of way that we can leverage uh, venture capital into our community to, to support the folks who want to be here. And we need to um, look at relationship-based relationship opportunities, networks. We have a lot of folks working in this area. So it's just finding a way to accelerate that opportunity. I've done a lot of talking, and I, I do, truly do want to turn this over to, to the people who are here. But just to give you some idea, this is what you saw on the previous slide. We have a sequenced way we want to do this, some priorities that you see in the center, then we would move out. I'm not saying this is linear. That's because that's why it's a circle. These are going to happen uh, simultaneously in some cases. This is just an example of that tightly integrated feedback loop that we want to establish between industry and education. This is the kind of detail we have in this roadmap. And you see on the right there the level of effort level of impact and like level of urgency, we have that established for each one of those um, uh, action steps, as I described, those commitments. Just to give you an example, we, went deep, we, did, we asked Deloitte to do a deep dive into manufacturing, healthcare, and IT. What is it we really need to know about the future so that we're ready with the upskilling and training and education opportunities? So in manufacturing, this is the kind of information that's presented. Uh, Industry 4.0 technologies, what this shows you is what, uh, that these are new ways of working. 
These are the technologies that are needed. And then this is what the future of workforce will need to have in terms of skills. I'm not going to go into great detail, but again, this is an example. Then we go to the level of what would those roles be in a future of workforce? They're transitioning from one thing to another. This is called a demand planner. It shows you what those responsibilities are today and what they're going to be tomorrow. Then it gives you a day in the life of what a demand planner will be. So when you're recruiting, trying to recruit for these positions or create these positions, it gives you a roadmap of what that work would look like as an employer and an employee. Same thing in IT. Systems engineer. What the future skills are going to be needed and what that day in the life of a systems engineer looks like. That person gets up at 6.30 a.m. I think that's a little too early, so. Um, you folks in the IT business, you're crazy. Um, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna uh, end there in terms of presentation. I'd like for um, Joseph to kick us off, uh, talk about your involvement. The DEI is, is embedded in all of this work. We heard it over and over. Then um, we'll turn it over, I think, to, um, Stephanie and, and Sherry, and then Luis and, and uh, Deborah to talk about taking risks and investing boldly. And then we'll ask Sherry and Keith to talk about what's currently going on. So thank you guys. Thanks, Tammy. My, my dream has come true. It says attorney on here, so <laughs> I finally made it. Uh, but in all seriousness, thank you all so much for engaging with us today. Um, particularly as we look at the ambition statement, one of the things that I loved most about our group is that it was diverse and very reflective of our region, which is ultimately what I believe is our strength. Um, one of the things that we talked about as we were looking at the ambition statement, which, which took uh, multiple interpretations, took time and feedback, collective work, we took the institutional knowledge of our proven leaders who were joining us as well as the anecdotal data of others to come up with, we are a vibrant global community of possibilities that invest boldly, taste risks, and defies expectations. And as a young professional who is a transplant to this region and decided to make this community my home, um, I believe one of the beautiful things that we have an opportunity to do as we look at talent is really challenging the perspectives of how young people see opportunity in our region. Um, um, oftentimes, we don't uh, do our, our region justice when we talk about the opportunities that exist here, the deep, rich history that exists in our community. And one of the things that I've heard recently that I've taken to heart is if it can't happen here in our region, it can't happen anywhere. If you look at entrepreneurialism, if you look at the businesses that have come here and have begun to boom, um, it, it first happened in Wichita and it first happened in our region, and we truly have to take advantage of that. We see that we have an increase in Hispanic population, Latino population but we also see that we have labor shortages across the country and that is not any different for our community here. What's unique though is that we have Envision here, right? And we have differently abled community members who can help shorten that gap in terms of the labor shortage, um, which brings me to my next point of embracing the diversity, equity, and inclusion that we have in our region that a lot of regions do not have. And if we find unique ways to help tap into those populations, listening to their unique needs, and how do we leverage our industry and our workforce um, to kind of bridge the gap and meet us at the middle of success, then we can really move our region forward. Um, at Lead for America, the organization that I have the opportunity to work for, our mission is all about making sure that we show young people that they don't have to leave their hometown in order to obtain success. And we do that through uh, one-year service fellowships where they work alongside an entity uh, to tackle a critical challenge. Sedgwick County has already invested in a fellow, being proactive, being innovative, and saying we want to take advantage of our our young talent that we have here, and we want to make sure that other young people and young talent know that they have a future here as well. One of the beautiful things about our region, uh, as Tammy has already mentioned and Jeff as well, is if you want to attend a four-year institution, we have that. You want to attend a two-year institution, we have that. Want to trade or a technical skill, we have that. If you want a fellowship, we have that. And so we have the things in place. It's really about making sure that we are articulating to the community how to take advantage of those things, and more importantly, the difference that it can make not only 
only in their lives, their families' lives, but the community that surrounds them. Um, with that being said, I'm going to end my comments and reserve them uh, for the end should there be any questions, but there are other dynamic leaders who you will have an opportunity to hear from, and I want to yield my time to them. Thank you, Joseph. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Hi, how is everybody today? Good. Um, I just wanted to speak on behalf of not only Textron Aviation, but our parent company, Textron. And I, I wanted to just start by just resetting and restating how important this community is to the overall Textron enterprise. And I say that because I don't think people realize we now have three business units of Textron operating here in Wichita. Um, what you know of Textron Aviation, the Cessna and Beechcraft legacy, you know, 95-year-old manufacturing company is certainly the largest presence that we have here. But you may not know that we have also located um, a portion of Bell Helicopter here in Wichita for engineering resources. Um, when they saw, right, the great talent pool that we have here, our sister company. Can you speak into that mic? I'm sorry. We really want people to hear what you're saying. Oh, sure. Like, absolutely. You, might just, you could just hold it, too, if you want. This is fine. I'll lean. Okay. We Thank you. We want to be able to hear you, and they're saying you can't. Thank you. Um, so Bell Helicopter is uh, located here with some engineering resources, and just recently, and last Friday, Chairman Dennis had the opportunity to come out and see our newest business unit located here, Textron E-Aviation, which was just created in March with Textron's acquisition of Pipistrel Aircraft. Uh, which is located in Slovenia and Italy. So very exciting um, developments um, happening. And, you know, when e-aviation was started, they, they chose Wichita for their startup operations um, and have some really exciting developments happening um, for electrified uh, flight and the future of sustainable flight. So that's all happening right here. Those are all very exciting things. Um, when we think about, you know, our commitment and what we need, we we have more positions available than there are humans. Um, and so, you know, that is an exciting time in our company's um, history here. We have over a thousand jobs located, um, you know, on our careers page right now, 525 different types of skill sets um, and different job codes are currently open. Um, so we're looking at today, but we're also looking at the future, and it's very exciting to see how Deloitte has mapped out those careers of tomorrow, what we need to be doing to upskill our current workforce and those who have yet to enter our workforce as um, key highly skilled employees. Um, we, you know, we're doing a, a, a lot of investments as a company. Um, we have 350 college interns here this summer um, getting to experience everything that um, we do. We have more than 150 high school paid internships as part of the um, program with Workforce Alliance. So you, we could talk all afternoon about all of the different talent pipelines that we're exploring from military to sec second chance programs, um, differently abled persons, um, all of the different ways. And when I look at what Deloitte has delivered for us under the creating possibilities, that's what we do every day. And that's what we want to partner with um, all of those in the community to do that differently, to make that more nimble. We're fortunate to have a large voice in this community. And so when Textron Aviation um, you know, picks up the phone, we generally get a very vibrant conversation. All of our developing industries uh, need a model for that to um, have that kind of access to have the feedback loop, um, to tighten that feedback loop between business and education to make sure just we're being a lot more proactive. And, and with that, I'll turn it over to Sherry to really talk through more of the specifics in terms of the Creating Possibilities framework. Well, Stephanie, before they go on, a sure. uh, couple things. First of all, you identified some, some of the hurdles that you're trying to overcome when we were out there last Friday. And I heard it, but I think it's important that everybody hears uh, what some of the hurdles that you're facing. I think it's, it's, you, it's things that we've been talking about for a while. And I think as we talk about not only the talent pipelines and the systems in place to make those uh, to break down those barriers of employment for people in our community, we can't understate the pride of place work that we do and that we have to do. It is every day, multiple times a day, you know, we are seeing people who have experienced Wichita, who have come into Wichita, who love it here, but rents are, you know, rent is increasing. 
um, amenities in the community are not as vibrant as others that are trying to attract them. And I mean, just within my own department, uh, you know, I have multiple people who have chosen the Dallas-Fort Worth area or other communities because of, you know, the pride of place issues. And and it so it is it is frustrating, right, that we are a bit stagnant in some of those conversations um, and and keep going back to some of our our old fights and and want to want to move on and want to be progressive. Um, it's impossible to understate the importance of, of affordable airfare, of affordable housing, of vibrant amenities in our downtown, um, and how that really impacts um, our ability to attract talent here into the community. I appreciate that. I, w I was unaware, honestly, that uh, it cost up to $2,000 a month just to rent uh, an apartment here in, in downtown Wichita. And, and again, the kind of professional um, employees and and you know, direct employees want a lifestyle that's a, a exciting lifestyle, and they want to be a part of a vibrant community that's diverse. And so, I think everything that this you know ambition statement embodies is exactly the conversations we're having every day with our employees. Okay, before I turn it over to Commissioner Cruz, uh, again, I want to thank Textron. You led the way in getting career pathways uh, in our uh, high schools, working with State Board of Education. Uh, all of these different. Uh, Innovative ideas uh, have paid off, um, but they're a start. We have a lot more that we have to do in the future to make sure that uh, we've got the talent uh, available to us in the future. So, Commissioner Cruz. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a, a question about pride of place, uh, which is why I was trying to kind of get in where it was relevant. So mm -hmm. I'd like to bring it back to that point, if you wouldn't mind. And if you, if you could just expand on what pride of place, other than affordable airfare, um, the rents that are increasing in amenities. What are people specifically telling you? I mean, those are the things. Those are the most important factors, right? When you have some a competitive job offer, um, you know, when when talent is trying to pick from one offer to another, and they have four communities that they're picking from. Um, you know, this is a great place to live and a great place to you know raise a family and and you know expand a career. But we're not Dallas. We're not Austin, right? We don't have some of those types of um, large-scale cultural, icon iconic, you know, gathering spots. Um, restaurants on the river, riverfront um, master plan is very important, right, to people looking at um, very similar job offers, and the location is the differentiator. Um, you know, it's having to. Speak Almost those things become, you know, a our affordability has been the thing that has been a differentiator in the past. Those things are starting to go away, right? Those are are it's it's more expensive to fly out of here, right? And that then overcomes affordability in other areas. Um, rents are again downtown where people want to live. Um, are increasing, and so they can spend the same amount of money at you know downtown Fort Worth as they do here in Wichita. Um, so all things being equal, right? Everybody's evaluating those options and, and picking options that um, you know they see as more attractive. I have some other comments, but I'll wait till. Thank you. Well, just to make it real, one stat you gave me Friday said you were hiring three engineers, and all three chose to go to Dallas. Those were some folks uh, actually in the communications department. So I am hiring if anybody's interested in a communications <laughs> role. I have several openings. Um, but yes, we have uh, lost some really great talent um, because of some of those just quality of place issues. Very good. Well, sorry to interrupt your all's oh, flow. Thank you. Uh, we turned over to Dr. Utash. All right, so just real quickly, one of the things that Stephanie and I have had the honor to do the last four years, I believe, is we've co-chaired the Business Education Alliance, which is a subcommittee of GWP. And, um, you know, we really, we were off to a, re the BEA has done a lot of good work. We were both on it before we co-chaired it. I think we've been on it since day one. Uh, and it's done a lot of really good work. But the results of this study, just so you know, the results of the work that's been done shows us that we need to 
just like many other things that, that have happened post-COVID, we need to recalibrate, we need to reimagine what that might look like. And so I think you're going to see some changes coming as a result of the work that we've gotten from Deloitte that really puts us in a very strategic manner where we're, um, where the integration between industry and education is even greater as we move forward in order to tackle some of these really, really critical issues, both today, tomorrow, and in the future. So I wanted to add that. Very good. Thank you. Who's next? I think that uh, Deborah and Luis are going to talk about uh, appetite for risk. Well, thanks for having us here. Um, so when they first brought this group together, they had asked a question. I think the question was, what is one thing that could be holding Wichita back? Uh, for me, I personally said an appetite for risk. Um, and it came from a number of different, different experiences, but primarily as a startup founder here. Um, and the reason why I said that is because when my sister and my sister and I were co-founders of our business, when we decided we're going to do, um, we're going to start quick hire, getting off the ground was so dang hard for so many reasons in relation to people not being willing to take risk or supporting um, us for, for different reasons, right? So access to capital was one of them, us not having the tech background, um, being based in Kansas, can somebody launch a tech startup with, you know, and the, the access to talent. I remember one of the venture capitalists was like, you have a great idea, but I'm just not sold that you can find great tech talent in Kansas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we had these things constantly um, back to back. Um, but you know, I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity um, when it comes to increasing our appetite for risk because it's extremely contagious. So for me, I never considered entrepreneurship until my husband did. And as I started being exposed to what he was interested in, it just kind of rubbed off on me. And now here I am wanting to do the same to others and talking to others about um, entrepreneurship and taking risks. And so it really just takes... Um, you know, some, initi some initiating in certain areas that I think can really be a great domino effect for our community. So one of the elements, like I mentioned, is investing. Um, just access to capital is a huge barrier for entrepreneurs outside of just tech. It's just across the board, very, very difficult. And a lot of businesses, they die in that zero to one phase because they just don't have that access to the resources. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, you know, venture capitalists would say, hey, at, at this stage, you need to rely on friends and family. And I'm like, well, no friend or family is going to give me $200,000. So you, <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's where, you know, your community and different organizations can support you and, 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 and back you and help you in getting that idea off the ground. Because now that we're um, at the stage that we're in, now we're starting to, it, raising capital isn't as much of a barrier as it was in the beginning. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, and then, like I said, even the access to talent is extremely difficult. Trying to get others to come to Kansas um, to, to work for um, work for us is extremely difficult. One, competing with wages is challenging. But even for all of the mention, uh, all of the reasons that she previously mentioned, um, is challenging. So it's like, why not try to recruit local? Well, I try to recruit local, and people are, are like too risky, don't want to work for you. Um, and so again, I think it's also that mindset, like what are we rewarding? What are we saying is a viable career path? While, you know, I've worked at Coke, I worked at Spirit, they're, Textron, these are amazing companies that are pillars in our community. I think there's also other great options too that can provide great development opportunities and who are we spending our time with? Are we spending our time also to come and check out the startups and see what they're doing? Are we rewarding them for what they're doing and the future innovation that they're facilitating as well? So I think it just, um, it all has an interconnectedness that could really help if we um, really were invested in increasing our appetite for risk, thinking beyond what we know, um, what we've come to know over the years and just thinking about the future. So. It for me. Thank you. Oh, okay. You're a tech guy. <laughs> I miss this light. You know what I mean? Uh, hi, commissioners. Commission I? Commission Oxen? 
I'm not sure what the plural is, but thank you for having me here. Uh, whenever I talk to a body like yours, I, I, I like to take a minute and say, I'm kind of in awe of what you do. The depth and the breadth of what you have to consider, what people come to you and talk about, and what you have to measure is considerable and diverse. Uh, this is important, but so are a lot of other things. And so all the words after this is just to say that we understand the considerations you have to take into place. Regarding uh, Deloitte and this exercise, um, I find it interesting that what Deloitte and the Greater Wichita Partnership was able to do with this, right, was uh, it really wasn't inventing a, a, an incredibly new notion of a roadmap. Sure, we're at a transition point with the pandemic that's accelerated what we need to do for, if you will, the S-curve of our community, right? Uh, but a lot of these things existed, right? And, and where I think we struggle as a community sometimes is just aligning ourselves so that we're all pulling in the right direction, uh, pushing us forward. Uh, and, and to some extent, that means being comfortable with with risk to some degree, right? Um, what does that risk look like? Uh, you know, it can vary from project to project and thing to thing. So as you're presented the opportunities, as we look at what the future of work, the roadmap for talent looks like, you're going to see lots of things that make these same claims, right? Like, hey, this is important for us to have the community and the jobs and the talents of the future. and and they might all be right, um, and and I recognize that's difficult, but uh, the, the future isn't full of sure bets for us, right? Um, and if anything, through this process, through this experience, that's what I walked away with. There really isn't a sure bet, but there has been a track record of really good successes in our community. Like, maybe it surprises you to know. I don't, I don't know if it surprised anyone else, but it surprised me to know, for instance, that we're the number three concentration of engineers in our country. You know? The first is MIT Boston area. I'm, I mean, that's pretty elite level ranking, right? Uh, I'm a software engineer, so I'll claim some of that engineering. <laughs> but... You know, I also wear blazers, so I'm going to say I'm a little hipper than that. And, and, and I'll throw out there that we're very good at analysis in our community because we're a community of engineers. We're fantastic at analyzing a problem to death, quite literally to death. Um, and when we talk about risk, you know, that's what I would ask for our, from our community and from our community leaders is, you know, we're not going to have a sure bet and a perfect plan. That's what risk really means. Uh, people hear risk and they think about what they're going to lose. And what we're saying is anything that we try will leave us better off than we are. Right? So, so let's look at it from that perspective. I think that's what I walked away with. I, ho I hope others did. I was surrounded by brilliance. I'm not even sure what I was invited. Uh... <laughs> But I was glad to partake. Thank you. Thank you. Keith. Chairman Dennis, Commissioner Cruz, Commissioner Lopez, good afternoon. Always a pleasure to be here with you today and very pleased to be part of this conversation um, with you all and as Jeff indicated in his opening remarks uh, when you know we were first learned about the opportunity with the Deloitte study we really did want to be all in and for a couple of reasons I think as most of you know the Workforce Alliance where you're friendly local workforce board here in the greater Wichita area serving our six counties and primarily one of the things we really look to do is to leverage resources and align services so we can create significant community impact um, over the last 15 years, uh, we have helped to bring in over $50 million in employment and training resources to this community, and that is above and beyond the annual allocation we get from the federal government. Uh, the One Workforce Grant 
is a $9.9 million grant, and it really focuses on the intersection of technology and the workforce. And what we did, um, we really looked at the advanced manufacturing sector. Uh, you heard Stephanie talk about the developments at Textron and understanding um, all the technical nature of the jobs that are going to be created under not only those new business units, but just uh, by aviation itself moving forward in terms of engineering, production, and design. Um, and certainly, we got to hear from Luis just now, and he's, uh, you know, with Key Centrics, a number of companies that, uh, IT tech companies that are making uh, Wichita, South Central Kansas, their home, and growing. Uh, and so the grant we got was really focused on, on how do we have an impact on those. And our goal was, it's a four-year grant. We hope to be actually investing in training programs that do not currently exist at the beginning of that grant. And so how can we be on that cutting edge? And so the Deloitte study gives us a great opportunity to do so. Um, it really does look, in, and some of the slides, and I know you guys will get to see a, a more complete presentation of the work from Deloitte, but it really does break down some of the future occupations that we expect to have within these companies. And, and so our, our goal is how do we impact that, that speed to market when it comes to skills training, um, and how can we grow our own? I mean, we certainly recognize uh, that in our community um, we do have uh, – pockets of high unemployment. We do have access issues to certain populations to, to good careers and good jobs. And so, again, as we look at what the Deloitte study is telling us, we want to make sure we're making the right investments, that we're empowering the right individuals uh, so we can keep our business and industry, so key centrics can grow, so Textron can grow those business units there. Um, and, and overall, what, what the Workforce Alliance is looking to do with our grants, and in particular the One Workforce Grant, we're not looking just for a one-off where we train a 1,000 people, get a 1,000 people jobs. Hey, that's great. Fantastic outcomes. But how do we have a more sustainable model moving forward? So how can those thousand people we train be on a sustainable plan that suddenly that's 10,000 people over the next few years under these same models, these same systems? Um, and, and how do we impact systems change? And again, looking at what we're talking about in the Deloitte study for this community, uh, I think can really help us get there. Um, and I think the most last thing for us and last thing I'm going to say um, uh, is that we really want to align our employment and training investments with economic development priorities. And so the companies that we are trying to attract here, that we're trying to retain here and expand here, are, are eligible and in line for the resources we have. And just a few key examples, some of the companies we're already making investments in with our One Workforce Grant are Novacoast, uh, Keycentrix, um, Integra, we're talking to Spirit, uh, Cox Machine, we're talking to Textron right now, again, trying to line our resources up to really have that impact. And again, I go back to the Deloitte study, uh, really focuses on this infrastructure that needs to be created, these partnerships that need to be leveraged, and how do we have a, a, a system in South Central Kansas that is then recognized and really provides benefits to uh, the taxpayers that, that elect you all and the people that we're all here to serve and our friends and neighbors that we're sharing our community with. So uh, happy to respond to questions when we get to that part of the presentation. And again, just really happy to be part of this great coalition. Thank you. Sure. So I'm going to kind of bring it home. <laughs> Bring it on. Um, because I think it's important for you all to know as investors and for the community to know that not everything's new and different with this. There's a lot of things that are currently, that we're currently working on collaboratively, uh, and those things can scale and expand as a, as a result of this work, and then it will inform some of our future work. So just quickly, you know, we've got the one workforce uh, grant that we're working on. We've reinstituted the Wichita Promise after three years uh, for high wage, high demand in aviation and CNA. And I want to say the only reason we could do certified nurses aid was because thank, thank, thank the legislature for modernizing the practices and creating new law in this last session um, that um, creates more reasonable criteria to hire teachers. So because of that, we have 80 certified nurses aid students coming out within 60 days. That's unprecedented. Um, the aviation tax credit, yes, we got to blow that. We got to really use that. And then I think the final thing I would just say is the whole applied learning crusade that Wichita State University and WSU Tech are on through the Shocker Career Accelerator for all students to have a paid applied learning opportunity, no matter what their program is. 
Um, but if we look to the future to this, some of the things that are happening, we mentioned the EDA grant. Commissioner Lopez has been super, super helpful in D.C. on this. But that builds, that, that grant, If should we get that, that transforms our community into advanced manufacturing and industry 4.0 in a way that we could never do it without it. So I think that's important. And, and, and you're going to see that um, through a new initiative that the university and WSU Tech are working on together, you're going to see the rollout of um, some very short-term stackable certifications with industry credentials in IT, in cloud computing, and software development, hardware development. You're going to see that coming out. The ARPA funds that the city provided to us uh, will finish out the Future Ready Center for Aviation and Manufacturing at North High School, which again plays into the, uh, to the um, aviation career pathway. So it kind of puts that on steroids, we hope. And it also provided the dollars for infrastructure to create the same kind of Future Ready Center for Healthcare at WSU South. And then finally, certainly the, the other thing that this work helps inform uh, is as we continue to, you know, explore and march through uh, looking at a biomedical campus for downtown Wichita with Wichita State University, KU Med, and WSU Tech. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I appreciate all the update. Uh, education is important to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone back and got a teaching certificate and, and taught one of my great students is sitting in the back of the room. <laughs> A graduate of, of North High School, by the way. But uh, we're, we're very lucky in this community that we have visionary leadership uh, across the board to look at what's happening at WSU and the Health Science Center and uh, the, the partnership with uh, uh, the folks over at uh, KU Med Center and the new DO school we've got going downtown. The, the things that are happening out at, uh, at WSU with uh, applied learning, uh, these are all critical uh, to developing the future. Uh, my background is military, and uh, so a lot of my uh, thoughts are framed around 29 years of doing that. Uh, and the military is very good at growing their own. As they'll bring in an 18-year-old uh, high school graduate, and, and before long, well, not before long, a couple years later, they'll be working on nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, and they're 20 years old, and they got their hands on a nuclear weapon. Uh, so uh, you have to be able to, to grow your own, and that's what we need to do here, uh, uh, is, is how do we get that 18-year-old uh, uh, student coming out of high school and getting them to the point where that, uh, we're going to grow them into the leaders of tomorrow. That's another thing that I thought the military did very well, is that, uh, first of all, uh, military is very interested in secession planning because you don't know if the leaders are going to be there tomorrow. Uh, so as a result, uh, that's something that I've always stressed uh, with our manager here, even uh, in the civilian area, is that we always have to have secession planning to make sure that uh, if anything happens, we've got the leaders to move into the, into the next step. Um, when I was on the, uh, I was chairman of the Kansas State Board of Education, and I got to be a member of the executive board of the National Association of State Boards of Education. So this talent uh, concept or this idea isn't new. I was working that back at the point uh, when I was working on the National Association of State Boards. And I had an opportunity to meet a, a Army. Yeah, he was still a good guy. He was Army. But <laughs> uh, Lieutenant General, and he was uh, uh, in, uh, the commander of a sessions clan for the United States Army. And so he came to, the, to NASB and said, hey, we're having trouble finding people for the Army. Uh, what, what we learned was that uh, uh, if you look at a high school graduate, only 25% of every high school graduate was qualified to go into the Army because they either had, uh, they were overweight, they, were, they couldn't pass the physical fitness tests, uh, they couldn't pass the ASVAB test, so they were coming out of, the, out of high school without the education they needed in order to be able to take these jobs in the future, or they had some kind of drug, alcohol, or criminal cases, and so they weren't qualified. So everybody is looking for that 25%, not just the military, but Every one of uh, our employers here in, in Sedgwick County are looking for that 25%. They're, they're the cream of the crop. And so how do we get that 
25%, and that's what you all are doing is building us the roadmap on how we're going to gather uh, that group of people and keep them here in Sedgwick County to, to fill the jobs that uh, we need uh, in the future. So the things like uh, this Deloitte study, the work for GWP, the things that are going on at WSU Tech and WSU and, and our uh, friends in Newman University and, and our, in our, each of our different uh, uh, businesses that we've got throughout this community are critical, uh, but how do we attract these young people uh, for the future? I apologize. <laughs> and how do we keep them here once that uh, uh, we graduate them from high school? So uh, this gives us a roadmap, gives us kind of an idea. I appreciate the time and effort that's been involved in this. Uh, uh, we can't put this on the shelf. We've got to implement it at this point in time. Uh, and as I said, when we started out uh, the meeting today, we do have the aviation tax credit, but that's just one of our different areas uh, that we're interested in supporting in this community. So we've got to think of what the other things are uh, for the future as we build our legislative agenda for next year. And, uh, and not just uh, the, what I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, some kind of a uh, health uh, tax credit to, uh, for to vote to training our health professionals of the future, but what other types of things can the state government uh, help us with here in our community in order to be able to, to uh, grow our own and, and keep them here? So, Commissioner Lopez, you got anything you want to add? I would just add on to the health piece. Um, we had the conversation this morning with Via Christi, and really they're having some significant challenges. and. And I know um, when we were touring the Smart Factory, one of the things that was brought up is how can we get into our hospital and healthcare systems and what can we do to help them um, alleviate some of that burden. So I don't know if that's something that we can work with our hospitals and start. I don't know when the plan was to kick some of that off, but if we could get some of that started um, as soon as possible because they are having some significant challenges that um, we're going to see what we can do to help. But we can't fix this problem. We really do need to look at how hospitals and healthcare systems are going to run in the future and, and start to try to build that path for them sooner than later. So that's really what I would add. But thank you so much for all of this work. I mean, it's so important that we're looking towards um, being innovative and, and really looking at what does the future hold because we're going to get there eventually. But if we get to be at the start of some of these conversations and really get to dictate how that looks in our community, then that helps us bring people um, here and, and wanting them to be here and taking risks and being innovative is is critical in that. It's not always easy, but it is critical that we're um, a part of that. So I appreciate the work that's gone into this. And, you know, I think however we're able to help, we would, we would like to. Thank you. And Commissioner Cruz. Thank you. Um, there was a lot to unpack here. I have wrote like copious notes, so I will be fast, and that's hard for me to do. I know you guys know that. But, Luis, I just want to say um, you made a very good point about the fact that we have a lot that we have to consider. And one thing um, over the past four years that I have seen is just the way government does op the way we operate. Um, we spend a lot of money on the back end, and we could translate that to the front end and get a lot more out of it. So, for example, you know, we have to streamline our own processes because we employ over 3,000 people here. Um, cutting waste, doing things differently, we could stop paying to just maintain this system and spend tax dollars on transforming lives, like what we're talking about here, right? Making transformational type changes. Transformational type changes that if we don't have to pay to incarcerate people, we can pay them to work on the streets in uh, wait with wages like the guy who came on my porch yesterday he lived across the street for a while and now he is I've been working on um, helping him get his uh, 501c3 up because he wants to provide rides to people to AA and NA meetings but he doesn't know how to do that so I've been working with him and I asked him I we just talked very candidly about how much money he makes per hour at his factory job and his heart is in helping people being a peer support specialist let's say. I asked him how much he makes. He makes $15 an hour. I said, would you be a peer support specialist for $15 an hour? Would you help? Would, would you do that? He said, of course, I'm already doing it. I'm working all day long and then I'll work all night long because I'm already doing it. So getting paid to transform lives like that, like a mental health technician, like starting at a lower level, uh, an entry level type. So we're, yes, we need psychiatrists and all of that. So I'll, I'll, I'm getting off here. I want to go back to this. So 
future of work and, and your ambition statement here. What I love about this is just not necessarily this goal, but here, understanding the nuanced needs within our community and invest in areas that drive access and inclusion to achieve our goal of belonging for all. So Project Wichita, what was quality of place, Evan? How, how did that rank? Quality of place was what? Like the issue itself? Yes. Um, it's hard to, to, to boil it down to one. Number two, was, Sherry I says. I think it was two, wasn't it? Number two, mental health was six, mm -hmm. right? Was sixth on the, the list. Top ten, yeah, that was number six. Talent was kind of the first five or six of, of those. So going to the pride of place that um, excuse me, Stephanie mentioned, um, goes back to what are under the creating possibilities tab, um, increasing supporting services for underserved communities in Wichita. If Ruby's culture campus, Miss Janice Thacker, if she comes to us and says, I need $100,000 to create Ruby's culture campus over off of 13th Street, is that going to be a transformational opportunity for communities of color to have an entrepreneurial space to build their business? Absolutely. That's transformational type change that people come and ask which government for all the time. We get questions like that all the time. Um, the, the other thing here with investing boldly, bus stop benches. We, we have a lot of money in those bus stop benches on Douglas, but when you go around town, have we, took, have we looked at the city of Wichita's transformational change and their transportation plan? Who do they pick up and where do they pick them up? And do we have stops there? Do we have a bench there? Do we have the same type of quality of place that we have downtown on Douglas at all the other bus stops in town? We don't. We don't even have maps. Those are things that we could be doing. Um, the other thing about um, found, foundational uh, commitment, so iconic places, I heard somebody say that. What are we doing to invest in Midtown, the North End, the Northeast, all of North and South Broadway, right? South Broadway and North Broadway are the center of our city. Are we doing things to invest in that when it comes to addiction services and homeless treatment? Um, and so I say all of this because this is so exciting and I'm like super bummed that I was not in this room because this is my wheelhouse for sure. Like I am dream big, I am take risks. I do believe that you, that you have to take risks in order to achieve things. I think who said it here? Um, thinking beyond what we already know, right? The future isn't... I'm full of sure bets. I mean, we could, I, I have a whole laundry list of inspirational quotes from this meeting today because of each one of you. And so I hope that, like Chairman Dennis said, I hope that we translate this into actionable steps, some of the things that we're talking about and creating transformational type things. Because I don't know about you, but as a commissioner, I'm tired of rubber stamping budgets that we're just maintaining. We have the opportunity to do transformational things. And so, you know, I, I think that this could be a really great um, st stepping off point for the private sector, and then we need to shove it into the public sector as well. And that's, you know, that's how I, that's how I roll. That's who I am. I play a different part than my colleagues here, and I think that it's important to understand that we all have different roles in this, and I'm excited to drive this kind of stuff home here. So thank you for being here today. Please invite me to the next one of these. I will invite myself if I know where it's at. <laughs> Again, appreciate your time and thanks for all the work. Again, thank you for everything. Uh, before I turn it back over to either uh, Jeff or uh, Tammy, uh, you, you gave us an opportunity to ask you questions. Do you have anything that you'd like to ask a commissioner? Because this is one of the few times you get to sit here and, and ask a commissioner questions. Just say yes. No, I'm just, um, <laughs> no I, I think that, uh, Mr. Chair, that, you know, as I heard Louise speak and others, you know, I, we've got in this work, this is where we can all come together, regardless of who we are, what organization we're with, to say, how do we rally to make these things happen, right? And, there, and it's going to happen at all different levels, levels right? There's going to be so many different things rolling. But I think with this work, it's how is it that we pull it all together, and say, what are we going to go achieve? And then, however you can, or, or through the resources that are available, that happens. You know, I see there's there's so many different organizations. You know, one of the things that COVID nineteen taught us, right, is that you started presenting questions or challenges to this community. Forty nonprofits came together through a task force to say, here's how we can solve it. And, and I think that works really well. So we're going to continue to move that forward. Um, we appreciate the time to come for y'all today. I think, in, in a large part. Mr. Chair, we're going to be coming back to you all to say, here are our opportunities. 
um, we'd love for you to consider it. Um, we're going to look at how we leverage those moments too, so that there's private sector stepping into it with you as the public sector. So we appreciate you allowing us this opportunity today. And certainly, anytime you have questions, let us know. Very good. Okay. Thank Again, you. thank you for everyone for what hard work that you've gone into for this. Uh, hopefully, this gives us all the whole community, not just Sedgwick County, but the whole community, uh, a roadmap for the future. And Stephanie, you can't recruit any more about people, so disregard that. <laughs> Thank you. All's fair in <laughs>